Great. Good morning. So today is Thursday. I want to ask if you raise your hand if you honestly forgot today was Thursday, didn't know what it was. Okay. Thank you for your honesty. About a third of you. I had to remind myself and check myself. Um, just as we get started, I want to warm you up with a couple of musical memes. So. Awesome. Paper jam. Paper jam. All right. All right. So this morning, I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles um, to the letter Colossians, chapter 3. We're going to be starting in verse 1. Today we're going to be, um, Paul's going to get a little bit more practical in this passage. So far, the first day we talked about um, the whole idea of wisdom. Paul was actually praying for wisdom for, his, for the people in Colossae and for us. Um, on Tuesday, we talked about what it means to give God first place, to make him supreme over all things. And yesterday, we kind of got to the heart of the whole matter, talking about what it means to be rooted in Christ. No matter what comes your way, when we're rooted in Christ, we're ready to stand. We're ready to stand. And today, we're going to be start getting even more practical about what it means to be raised with Christ. Um, taking off the old clothes and putting on the new clothes. That'll be... Um, so today we're going to be talking about the old clothes, putting off those things that are sinful and not appropriate to what it looks like to be a Christian. And then tomorrow, what does it look like to be putting on the new clothes, to put on the new self, according to what Paul's talking about here. So let's start in Colossians 3, verse 1. Colossians 3, verse 1. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with God in Christ. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. In this passage, Paul's exhorting us towards Christ-likeness. He's saying, I gave you all the background. Um, you have been saved. You've been redeemed. Now I need you to start living like Christ. So Shehi campers, if you have been raised with Christ, there are a couple things that Paul's going to mention here. First, seek the things that are above. If you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated. In Psalm 110, 100, 110, he gives us a powerful picture of kingly authority, um, God on the throne. Live like Christ is, tr is the true king because he actually is the true king. So we want to make our desires, our desires, his desires, um, for maneuvering through life in such a way that we get what we want, we, we want what he wants in our life rather than getting what we want. I'm going to look up thir um, Psalm 37, 4. Psalm 37, 4 was a pivotal verse for me in my senior year of high school. I'll look that up. It's a delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give yourself the desires of your heart. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. And when I first read that passage, I understood it to mean, yes, God's going to give me what I want. But then, after talking to my mom and a few other people that I trusted, they explained to me that what God wants to do is he wants to give me my desires, but he also wants to change my desires to be his desires. Does that make sense? So as we're molded into the image of Christ, he's actually going to change our desires from being less about ourselves and more about what he wants. He wants to give us his desires, but he wants to give us the best. So the best is what he wants. Does that make sense? He wants to change us to want what he wants. So let's seek the things that are above. Next, set your mind on the things that are above. In contrast to setting your mind on earthly things, it's possibly a reference to the false teaching that we heard about in Colossians. Um, but I also believe that it, it applies to sinful areas of our lives that are taking place. Instead of thinking about those things that are of the flesh, let's instead think about what Christ desires, those things that Christ desires, the fruit of the Spirit. The solution to having your mind stuck in the dredges of earthly things is to set your minds on the things that God cares about. So why is Paul making such a big deal about all this for us? 
I think the next verse tells us that. Verse 3, For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, that you also will appear with him in glory. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ. Paul reminds the Colossians of what Christ has already done, is doing, and will do in them, and is grounds for their continued faithfulness and pursuit of Christ. So looking at a couple of things here, why he's doing that. How is Paul reminding of that, us of that? Well, first, our past experience. You've died to your old self and you've been raised with Christ. Those things that used to define us don't define us anymore. Those things that used to define us don't define us anymore. Jesus came to this earth on our behalf, lived a sinless life, died on the cross for our sins, and rose again so that we could be forgiven and so that we could have real life. Your past has been forgiven, and you are now a different person. Your past experience, he has showed us that our past experience has been, because we've been raised with Christ, our past experience and the sin of that has been washed away through Jesus. Now we're taking a look at our present experience. Your present experience, you are now hidden with Christ in God. The verb used here to emphasize the completion of an action with present results. You've been hidden with Christ. It's already been done, but the results are ongoing. The results are ongoing. Though you died to sin, the life you, are now, you now live is hidden or covered by Christ. And this speaks to our union with Christ. You are presently hidden from the wrath of God that we rightly deserve because you are in Christ. So sometimes it seems in our life like presently as we walk, Things don't always seem right, right? Because we still have sin and dwelling sin within us. Even though you might have been raised with Christ as a Christian, you still have that indwelling sin within you. And so our present experience tells us that, no, I've been hidden with Christ in God. Um, the wrath that I should deserve, I don't incur because Christ already did it for me. So Christ did it for me. And this changes everything. We're no longer identified with our sinful selves. Um, we're in Christ, and that is our new identity. That is our new identity is in Christ. So, a little side note. Having our identity in Christ doesn't mean that you're no longer unique. You are still a unique individual. Um, music is obviously a big part of your life. That's why you're here at camp. And it should continue to be a big part of your life as long as that part of your life is giving glory to God. So as long as your music is giving God, give glory to God, that's a major and important part of your life. But being a musician is not the primary way you find your identity. The primary way you find your identity is in Christ. So when you find yourself struggling with your identity as a musician, either because you're doing great and it leads to pride, or you're having a really tough time and you're struggling and it leads you to despair, Remind yourself that your primary identity is in Christ. That's so important in whatever it is you do in life that you're striving after, is that your primary identity is in Him. Because we all tend to do that. When we're doing well, it's like, oh yeah, this is what I'm all about. When we're struggling, we, we, we put ourselves down. But the truth is, is, that is not our primary place of finding identity. And third, Paul's telling us to look to our future experience. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. This is looking forward to a time in history where Jesus returns to this earth, both to judge the world and to gather his people. If you are his people, we look forward to the new heavens and the new earth where the sin is no more and where we are still unique individuals using our talents, but we will be able to live with him in unbroken um, harmony and peace and br unbroken fellowship. And this future experience is what gives us the motivation to live for Jesus right now. Because one day he's going to appear, and the Colossians and all of us Christians throughout time will appear with him in glory. And so we should live, live rightly now. The way we live now should reflect what it means to know Christ. And it's a challenge for us to live up to the potential that Christ made possible for us in the gospel. So now in this next section we're going to be looking at here, 
we're going to be getting a little bit more specific. Paul's going to go from talking about our past lives, present lives, and future lives in general terms to talking about it in specific terms. terms. In a lot of ways, he's going to call all of us out right now. He's going to get into some specific areas of our life that he's going to say, if you are risen with Christ, these are some areas that you need addressed. And one thing I like about this list, and at the same time don't like about it, is that he hits a broad range of sins. He doesn't allow us to say, you know what, oh, that's not something I deal with, so I don't need to worry about it. He kind of hits a broad spectrum, so it hits most areas of our life. So let me get started with that in verse 5. We're going to be looking at verse 5 of chapter 3. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these things, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. So put to death whatever is earthly in you. Paul here is talking about those actions that come from our sinful natures. Since we have a heavenly mindset because of what Christ has done by raising us in Christ, we should be eager, eager to get rid of behavior that does not reflect that mindset. And so, as I look at that list, one more disclaimer. This is not a conclusive list. So, don't think you're off the hook just because you don't see your exact struggle named here. Um, but it's a solid list, I think, and I think it covers a pretty broad range. So let's start with sexual immorality. Actually, the first several will deal with that. And that is dealing with any kind of sexual sin. So what is sexual sin? And I think the Bible is clear that any sexual act, mind, heart, or action, apart from what God has designed for us, apart from what God has designed for us in marriage, um, it's sexual sin. Um, and that is an area that, as a Christian, we need to repent of. It's an area that we need to turn, turn and walk the opposite direction. Um, just because Paul puts this first doesn't mean that he's pulling it apart from all the other sins that we have in our lives. Um, just like any other sin in our life, um, we are under the blood and Christ wants to forgive us. And so just because he lists sexual immorality, um, he wants us to deal with the um, seriousness of the sin and the gravity of it because it affects so many other areas of our life and can pull us down. However, that's not an area that Christ can't forgive. It's just as forgivable as other sins. So this is an area, um, sexual immorality, where we need to bring that before God, sometimes on a daily basis, um, to ask for his um, forgiveness and also his power through the Holy Spirit. So sexual immorality, any kind of sexual sin. Impurity. Impurity. That's the moral corruption that's probably applied to sexual sin. Impurity, that moral corruption from within, within our minds. Um, that impurity that starts in our minds and leads to our hearts um, and goes outward from there. Passion. Passion could be translated um, as lust and seems to point to the mind behind the action. Um, very close to that Im impurity that's um, dwelling within our minds and hearts. Evil desire. Evil desire, I believe that's pointing to our basic human tendency of our flesh to sin. Um, the evil desires that ha we have within us. Sometimes when we become a Christian, um, you think, you know, I shouldn't be dealing with these evil desires. But the fact is, is that um, we, are, we have been renewed in Christ, but we also are still fighting that flesh. And evil desires start within us, and it's that basic human tendency to sin and to walk apart from Christ. And so that's another area that we need to ask forgiveness on a daily basis and ask God to renew our minds so that our evil desires don't rule us. Um, it can be easy to wake up in the morning and just kind of go on with the day without thinking of asking God to be present in our life and to be Lord over our life. Um, but it starts right with our evil desires. Um, we can ask God in the and all throughout the day to be with us, to give us desires that are his, um, like we talked about in that 30, um, chapter, Psalm 37, 4 and 5. Ask God to give us his desires. Next, there's a covetousness and an idolatry. 
And that's just the greed for more. The greed for more. We all have that within us. Um, money and things can be idols, right? Um, it's when once we get one thing, we think in our minds, you know, if I get this one thing, I don't need anything else ever again. But has that ever worked out for anybody? I remember when I was eight years old. I was eight years old, and um, Nintendo, the original Nintendo, had just come out. And I remember thinking to myself, and even praying at one point, God. If my brother and I can just have this Nintendo and I can have Mario Brothers and Duck Hunt, you, most of you probably don't even know what Duck Hunt is, but it was like this gray gun that you'd point at the screen and it would actually kill ducks. It was really cool and high tech. I was pretty sure they would never think of anything better. And so with my Nintendo, I was so sure that I would never need anything again. And then two years later, Sega Genesis came out. And I said, God, I was just kidding that first time. Um, I need a Sega now. I need, I need to have Sonic the Hedgehog 1 and 2 to make my life complete. And then as you know, more things came out. PlayStation, PlayStation 1, 2. Are we at 4 right now? Where are we at? So these things, that's just one area of life, video games. But as a human being, our, our quest for money and things is endless, if not put under the control um, of the Holy Spirit. Um, that's a whole world where we talked about. We talked about materialism. Materialism is a worldview and an idol that is hard to resist. Um, and that, by putting Jesus first, I believe that we can get materialism under control. But that is tough. Covetousness and idolatry. We tend to make idols out of anything. We're idol factories as human beings. And that is an area that we need God's help. Not there yet. It, he also says, on account of these things, the wrath of God is coming. He's saying, these are serious things. Um, some people might look at a couple of these like idolatry and say, nah, it's not a big deal compared to like impurity and passion. Not a big deal. But Paul's not actually ranking these sins here. Paul's calling it all, all corruption. And he says, on account of all these things, all of these things, the wrath of God is coming. If these... Um, in these things too you once walked when you were living in them before Christ, but now you must put them away. And this has the idea, this has the idea of changing your clothes, putting them away, taking off those old things that were corrupt and dirty and putting on the new clothes. And that's just a word picture that Paul was giving his audience. Put off the old clothes and put on the new ones. And P.S. we'll be doing that a little bit more tomorrow, talking about the new clothes. Anger. He's going on the list here. He's not letting it stop where it did. He just had a little pause there and wanted to tell us, on account of all these things, the wrath of God is coming. And now he's adding anger, wrath, and malice. As I see, the anger, wrath, and malice are all very much interconnected. Paul seems to be pointing to three attitudes that are leading to the end result of slandering another person. Slandering another person. But if we want to get specific, um, anger... Um, is those outbursts of uncontrolled anger and rage. Um, anger on its own is not a sin. Anger is a basic human um, emotion that the Lord actually gave us. Um, we actually see Jesus becoming angry at sin. If you remember the scene with the money changers in the temple, Jesus actually became anger, but it was not an uncontrolled outburst of anger. Um, we need to check our motives behind our anger. Many times our anger for selfish reasons, and even when they're good reasons, when it be, cause uncontrolled passion, that becomes sin. So this is anger. Um, wrath. Um, anger is the emotion. So if wrath is, if, um, if anger and, um, no, anger is the emotion and wrath is the action. I'm sorry, I messed those two up. So if anger is the emotion and wrath is the action, um, and wrath is usually an action that's looking for revenge. So it starts with that anger, those outbursts, those angry feelings within, and goes out to wrath, trying to get revenge on another person, to slander them. Next we see malice. Malice. And that's the desire, the inward desire to harm another person. All going under the heading of slandering another person. Um, so anger is that uncontrolled outburst, that emotion. Um, wrath is that action to get revenge and malice is that desire to bring harm to another person and that's a bad place to be isn't it we can be angry at something but sometimes it kind of blows over we ask God for help with it and we're able to control it but when it becomes 
comes to that point when we actually desire to have harm to another person. That's an ugly, ugly place to be. That moves on to slander, tearing another person down apart with your words. And that can be done. That also starts in the heart. Um, we really want to tear someone down, usually for our own building up, but we want someone to know what we really think of them. Um, we might see somebody who is pretty confident in what they're doing and we want to bring them back to earth. Um, this is called sin. It's tearing another person apart with our words. Um, we're called as Christians to be people who are known for building each other up. So when we're instead known for tearing other people down, we're doing the exact opposite of what Christ has called us to. We're not acting like people who have been raised up with him. We're acting like people who are still um, submitting to the flesh. Next, obscene talk from your mouth. Um, this is filthy language of all sorts. Um, we have a lot of changes in our culture over the years. So Paul isn't here. He's not going to list specifically our curse words that we would think of today or the nasty, filthy things we would say today because cultures change, words change. Um, but we all know um, what words can be described as filthy. Um, in our culture, there's plenty of things that we know um, both on a sexual level and just on a degrading people level. Um, what does it mean to curse someone else and to curse the good things that God's given us? Obscene talk from our mouth and filthy language has no part in the Christian life. Next we move on to do not lie to one another. As Christians, we're called to be people who are honest. Um, the words that come out of our mouth should be truthful. If we don't speak what's truthful, we can't be tr trusted. No one's going to trust us. Our friends aren't going to trust us, and people in the world aren't going to trust us around us. We need to be trustworthy people who are our yes is our yes and our no is our no. Um, if we can't be trusted, we can't represent Jesus well. And that's a problem because we need to be people who are Christ representatives. And if we're no, and if we if we say we're Christ rep representatives and we're lying and things are coming out of our mouth that aren't true, um, we're not only tearing down our own names, but we're tearing down Christ's name. So as the church, we need to be known as people who are honest people. So tomorrow we're going to be going back talking about putting on, putting on those good things that. Um, we should be putting on as people who are raised with Christ. But before we get there, I just once again want to um, list a couple of applications um, for this, of taking off the old clothes. Um, once again, the Holy Spirit is doing work in your heart through his word. Um, his word never returns void. So I believe if you're a Christian, the Holy Spirit is working in your minds and hearts right now to convict you and challenge you and urge you on to certain things with this passage. So I don't want to speak in his place. But I do want to give you a couple of ideas to get you started. So I want to give you three points of application to get you started. The first is let's get serious about what it means to be raised with Christ. Let's get serious about it. To be raised with Christ means that there's going to be some changes in our life. Um, let's actually think about that. Let's evaluate that um, in our minds. Second, now it's, now it's actually the doing part. Identify those things and remove those sinful patterns that are in our lives. Uh, the problem is we can't do that on our own. Um, we need to go to Christ for forgiveness. And so we talked a little bit about this yesterday too. There comes a point when we need to identify the sin and then we need to ask God for forgiveness and repent, confess and repent, turn the other direction and start living like people who have been forgiven in those areas. And third, seek with God's help to live the lives, live a life that's honoring to him. Um, really, we think about these things, we think about how it affects us. How does the Bible affect me? But the truth is, is that we're on this earth to bring glory to God. So how can we live our lives in such a way that we're bringing much glory to him? Um, not glory to ourselves, but glory to him. And I believe as we're being led by the Spirit and putting off the old self and putting on the new self and asking forgiveness on a daily basis because it's an ongoing process, we're going to be bringing much glory to him um, who rightfully deserves those things. So I... I um, hope and pray that you can think through these things today and ask God to challenge you with them through his word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, 
we come to you today humbled by your word, um, just humbled by the work that you've done in our life. You are so powerful and loving to us to raise us up out of our sin when we were so unworthy. Um, when we actually didn't even want it, you did it for us, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Lord, right now, as we also talked about some of the sinful patterns um, that are still in the lives of us, of us as Christians, we ask that you would help us to identify those things and come to you for forgiveness. Lord, we know you want to raise us up out of the dredges, raise us up to, to be people who represent you well, Lord. Help us um, to humbly come to you for forgiveness and boldly move forward and live in that forgiveness on a daily basis and live for you, Lord. Thank you for caring for us so much and thank you for empowering us with your Holy Spirit to actually make these changes happen. We look forward to see these changes start to happen right now in our lives and throughout the week, the months, and the year ahead, Lord. And thank you for what you're making us into. In your name, amen.